Welcome to the City Club of Eugene's October 30th, 2020 program, the Oregon's Secretary of State Candidate Forum. This is the eighth program of our 2021 programming year. My name is Scott Coltrane and I'm the City Club President. Support for the City Club is provided by our members and sponsors. You can become a member of the City Club at our website, City Club of Eugene. Org. Our programs are always available on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page and are rebroadcast on public radio station KLCC 89.7 on Mondays at 7 p.m. We have both business and in-kind sponsors, including our diamond sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, exists to provide high quality affordable health care services and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. More information at www.kp.org. Support comes from the University of Oregon. Since 1876, UO has helped Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, Act creatively and live ethically. More information at uoregon.edu. Peace Health is proud to serve Eugene, Lane County, and beyond. As your hometown health care partner for more than 80 years, our mission is to keep you and your family healthy. Learn more at peacehealth.org. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning. LCC provides comprehensive, accessible, high-quality educational opportunities that promote student success. For more information, visit lanecc.edu. We would also like to thank and acknowledge the generous support we receive from the City of Eugene and from Lane County. On to today's program. I would like to thank Sandra Bishop and Joel Corin of the City Club Programming Committee for coordinating today's session and also thank Rebecca Gladstone and the League of Women Voters for co-sponsoring and co-coordinating today's program focused on the race for Oregon's Secretary of State. Today's forum is moderated by KLC's, KLCC's Chris Lehman. In Oregon, the Secretary of State oversees the Archives Division, which maintains the official records of Oregon government, the Audits Division, which provides oversight of public spending, the Corporations Division, which administers business filings, and the Elections Division, which performs administrative and oversight duties related to elections. If the Oregon State Legislature fails to establish a redistricting plan for state legislative districts, the Secretary of State intervenes to draw the boundaries. 2011 was the first time in a century that the state legislature completed a legislative and congressional district map without changes made by the Secretary of State or the courts. The candidates for Oregon's Secretary of State in this election include Shamia Fagan, Democratic Party, Natalie Paravicini, Progressive and Pacific Green Parties, and Kim Thatcher, Republican Party. State Senator Shamia Fagan was born in Portland and grew up in Dufer and the Dalles. She worked her way through college and law school, earning a JD from Lewis and Clark, and is now an employment attorney. She began public service as a member of the David Douglas School Board. As an Oregon State Representative and Senator, Fagan has worked to eliminate barriers to voting and increase access to the ballot. Senator Fagan is currently the chair of the Housing and Development Committee and sits on the Health Care Committee. She says she's running for Secretary of State because she knows it's never been more important to protect and expand our fundamental right to vote in Oregon. Natalie Paravicini 
is a naturopathic doctor who serves the medical Medicaid population. She grew up in South America and migrated as a youth to the U.S. Her prior experience includes covering infrastructure development projects and managing a successful nonprofit organization. She has been an active proponent of electoral and campaign finance reform for many years. As a Green Party member and environmentalist, she has long been deeply concerned about climate change and its current and future impact on sustainability, local economies, and small businesses. She believes that the race for Oregon's Secretary of State in 2020 is one of the few that exemplify the confluence of issues and the tipping point we find ourselves in in history. State Senator Kim Thatcher has called Oregon home for most of the last 44 years. She was elected to the House of Representatives from Kaiser in 2004 and re-elected to the Oregon House four times. Kim ran for the Senate in 2014 and was re-elected in 2018. Kim has been a business owner for over 25 years with two small road, road construction related companies with operations in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Kim is among the longest serving members of the Joint Audits Committee, served on several elections committees, and is one of the first members named to the Public Records Advisory Council. She was running for Secretary of State to protect fair elections, hold state agencies accountable, and provide Oregon businesses transparency and stability. On to today's program. Chris, I turn it over to you. Welcome everyone again to this uh, forum between candidates for Oregon Secretary of State uh, with the City Club of Eugene. And we're going to ask a series of questions throughout the hour uh, to each of the candidates. But to begin with, we will give each candidate up to two minutes for an opening statement. And we'll begin our opening statement with Natalie Paravicini. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Natalie Paravicini. I'm a um, candidate for Secretary of State for the Green Party and the Progressive Party. Uh, I came here as a migrant and we had our own hard times when we started here and then became a naturopathic doctor. I served the, the a Medicaid community um, with complex illnesses, particularly infections. And the reason I'm involved in uh, the Green Party and running for Secretary of State is because I think that we need fundamental change. We need ranked choice voting, electoral reform, so people feel free to participate fully and we have a variety of options and opinions into the electoral sphere. Right now, I think uh, the, the, all of the policies and decisions are really driven by big money, by big profits. You can read more about it in my blog at Paravicini for uh, Secretary of State, I have a blog. And um, uh, I also think that we need to put long -term, uh, the long-term health of our state and in, take money away from the military spending and invest in it in infrastructure development. As the fires demonstrate, uh, 15 of the 35 fires were started by transmission lines that were falling and the same is true in our infrastructure. Um, so rural communities really suffer the most because they have the least resources. Um, so vote for me, Natalie Paravicini, for Secretary of State. Thank you very much. Uh, next for an opening statement, we'll turn to uh, Kim Thatcher. Hi, thank you. Uh, in 2016, voters chose Dennis Richardson for Secretary of State. Thousands and thousands of voters crossed party lines because they realized we need checks and balances in our state government. They wanted someone who could conduct this office in a nonpartisan way. And I think if he was here, he'd be sailing on to reelection, but unfortunately he died last year. There's only one candidate in this race who will carry on his legacy of accountability, transparency, and integrity in state government. Both my uh, opponent, Shamia Fagan, and I both served with Dennis, but I'm the only candidate that 
Dennis's wife, Kathy, is willing to support. She knows me. She knows my character. She knows I will carry on her husband's mission of transparent government. I share the same uh, fundamental belief that Oregon needs strong, steady, independent leadership and not more people who are uh, beholden to a handful of special interests. I, um, as your next Secretary of State, you can count on me to run fair, honest elections. I'm a business owner, have been for 28 years now, and I will count on the the corporation division. I want to bolster it to help our economy get back on track and help our small businesses. Much when I started the small business advocacy office in 2011, and I, I initiated and passed the bill that determined the need for the small business advocate, and it was studied where it should reside in government. I know what it's like to manage people, which will help me lead this large agency. I'll continue working for a more open, transparent public record system where I've spent much of my time legislature working on, where people need to be able to access these records free, freely. And most importantly, I'll continue to conduct the audits that shine a light on where government's failing its citizens and then showcase what we're doing well. As the longest member uh, serving as the, on the Legislative Audits Committee, I know how that's done. I want the Secretary of State's office to help move families forward and continue the work that Dennis Richardson started before he passed while serving as Oregon Secretary of State. I ask for your vote this November. Thank you. And finally, for an opening statement, we turn now to Shamia Fagan. Well, good afternoon. I'm Shamia, and I first became aware of voting and politics uh, growing up in small rural towns in Wasco County. My dad was a staunch Republican and a single parent raising three kids by himself, my two older brothers and me. Our mom battled meth and heroin addiction for most of my life and was homeless on and off the streets of Portland. And so my dad was tasked with raising us by himself. And the summer before we started, before I started second grade, my dad took us on a camping trip. I remember a couple of weeks in the woods, uh, campfires, catching crawdads in Eight Mile Creek out in Dufer, and a big family tent. And it wasn't until many years later that my brothers told me what had really happened, that we had been evicted from our house in the Dalles, and we had nowhere to go. And my dad didn't want us to know that we were homeless, so he took us on a camping trip. That's why I've spent my career as a civil rights attorney and an Oregon lawmaker fighting for other Oregon families who were hanging on by a thread, just like mine was passing policies like paid sick leave and raising the minimum wage and housing stability for all 36 counties in Oregon. And I've also created the Office of Small Business Assistance right in the Secretary of State's office in my first term in the Oregon House and have been at the forefront of the fights to expand access to our democracy from automatic voter registration to most recently prepaid postage on our ballots. But when I first announced my campaign for Secretary of State, I quickly learned that most people have no idea what this job is. One of my older brothers asked me, so you'll get other people's coffee? So I always like to start there. At its core, I believe this job is about making sure that government works for everybody, for running elections that are fair and secure, auditing state revenues and programs to make sure they're making a real difference in the lives of people who need them most, conducting public records to keep our government open and accountable, running the Office of Small Business Assistance, and quite possibly conducting legislative redistricting using a nonpartisan People's Commission. I'm proud to be endorsed by newspapers all across the state, including the ones that endorsed Dennis Richardson four years ago. I'm their choice this year, from the Oregonian to the Willamette Week, to the Astorian, to the East Oregonian, the Bend Bulletin, and the Eugene Weekly. And today I'll be asking for your vote as well. Thank you very much. We'll next move on to a series of questions that will be directed uh, to each of the candidates. Um, and if anybody needs me to repeat the question, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, our first question will first go to Kim Thatcher. Uh, Oregon and the United States as a whole is very politically divided right now. Uh, Secretary of State is a position that requires working with literally every political party in the state of Oregon. How do you plan to work with people with whom you disagree? Well, uh, being a Republican in the state legislature for the past 16 years and 14 of them have been uh, as a minority member of the state legislature, 
I, I'm very practiced at it. In fact, in 2009, um, when Republicans were in a super minority within the, the House of Representatives, I worked across the aisle with uh, Jefferson Smith and Arlie, Arnie Roblin to pass uh, a landmark bill to put the state's checkbook online. It was uh, the transparency website was born that year and we worked together because we just wanted to show the people um, you know how their government works and that is something that I've done over the years. I've, I've passed many bipartisan bills including the one that uh, would study where a small business advocate would go and uh, that you know those are those are the types of things that I love working on and especially across the aisle and those I want to put together multi-partisan groups to help advise me on different things because we need those others perspectives and it's not just two parties there are many parties within our state and we need to recognize that and get their perspectives as well. Thank you Kim. I'll next direct this question to Shamia Fagan. Well thank you Chris. Uh, first I just want to note that what we're going to do in the future I think is best evidenced by what we've done in the past. And my colleague, Senator Thatcher, uh, when they didn't want to pass funding for our schools, uh, safe storage gun safety legislation, um, increasing our vaccine public health requirements or address climate change, they simply walked out and shut down the government and literally fled the state to hide from the Oregon State Police, then went on Fox News nationally, uh, essentially bragging about shutting down the Oregon legislature. So I think it's I think that's a better predictor of what uh, she'll do in the future is what she's done in the past when having to work with folks that she didn't agree with. Um, I take a very different approach. In fact, the first group I had to work with in the state Senate was the Senate Democratic Caucus that I had run against in my primary. I actually beat a, an incumbent Democrat to join the Oregon State Senate. And so the folks who have been running that campaign against me were now my caucus members. Um, and I quickly built those bridges and worked with my caucus members, working with Republicans in the legislature to pass, to enter Oregon into the National Popular Vote Compact. In fact, over the objection of the three most powerful Democrats in the Senate, I worked with Republicans uh, to get a chief co-sponsor to make sure that a Republican vote in Oregon matters as much as a Republican vote in Ohio or Florida or Michigan. Thank you. Um, we'll now pose this question to Natalie Paravicini. Yes, I just want to mention first that 40% of uh, the Oregonians are not really uh, registered in uh, either of the parties because they have, uh, they don't feel a lot of representation. So um, I'm part of those people who are really looking and not as opposition Republicans or Democrats, but as we need to represent everyone. And uh, <clears throat> I use, I run for office in Texas and the Green Party has actually a lot of appeal both uh, for the Republicans or Democrats, because we're really about common sense financial policies, policies that make sense, that are outside the box. Uh, and my biggest, uh, the, the, my biggest supporters were actually conservative talk sh shows in along Texas, where I was invited back to talk. Um, so I'm very used to speak across the aisle. I don't see aisle. I think that the, we are all in this boat. Um, I do have a lot of concerns about uh, one, you know, when a candidate for Secretary of State um, believes that there were arsons and is um, talking about it, that it's okay to set up um, barriers when there are fires and we're trying to, you know, address a, an emergency. I don't know that that is really sending a lot of trust about really working honestly uh, for people, for all of us, instead of a, you know, sector of the votes. Um, okay, uh, Natalie, I'm, I'm going to cut you off to move on to the next question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Our next question will first go to Shamia Fagan. Uh, Oregon has been a pioneer of vote by mail. Um, how confident are you in the security of Oregon's vote by mail system and what can be done to make it uh, even more secure? I am supremely confident in Oregon's vote by mail system and and I have pushed back every time that the president has spread lies about vote by mail. I've actually never voted any other way. I started voting, I became eligible to vote in 1999 and Oregon became a vote by mail state in 1998. We have an incredibly safe vote by mail system here. Um, and really we could have spread that across the country if we didn't have uh, the president and his allies actually out there spreading falsehoods about vote by mail, including Senator Thatcher, who called it a plague as recently as four years ago. Here's what's secure about it. 
We don't have any online vote counting machines. We use a unique barcode tracking for every ballot. We have forensic signature verification and we have a paper trail that makes every vote able to be audited. What I would do to improve safety is to make sure that we shore up the online voter registration system um, to make sure that our online voter registration is not susceptible to hacking. Um, but right now we can be very, very proud here in Oregon of our vote by mail system. Thank you. Um, Natalie Paravicini, your response to this question. I, I, I agree. I think that the voting by mail is uh, <clears throat> very secure. I mean, if you can pay your taxes and buy stuff online and send checks by mail, I don't really see wh what is the huge hurdle uh, to vote by mail. <clears throat> Um, it's been demonstrated to be a very safe system here in the United, in, in Oregon. Um, in, even uh, Dennis Richardson uh, showed that it was very safe. Um, and I think that it is a mode of voting that is accessible to a lot of people who otherwise would not have easy access to voting. And it should be expanded. Thank you. And I'll direct the question now to Kim Thatcher. Thank you. I do love vote by mail. I enjoy it personally. I would not want to change it. Now, having said that, when I was referring to something being plagued, we were having some problems with multiple ballots being printed and, and sent out to people. And um, I was hearing of other sorts of issues that just haven't been proven. So what we have is a system that has a lot of safeguards in place, but I think it would behoove us as Oregonians and as a Secretary of State candidate, I promised that I would give it a top to bottom review. Every step of the uh, voting process from registering to vote, clear it through counting that very last ballot. I think it would help us to look at having postmarks count like other states have been able to do. I think that would help uh, folks with uh, you know, issues with mail, like maybe in Eastern Oregon, they can't get their mail to Portland or wh wherever, <laughs> where it has to go through uh, the process to get back to their, um, you know, their, their local county clerk. But I, I just think that we also need to look at uh, how we protect wildfire victims, for instance, and other victims of disasters and, and where they might end up being displaced and making sure that information is getting out to them on how they can obtain their ballot as if they were sitting at their own kitchen table. I didn't see that information going out in a, in a wide manner this year, and it's unfortunate. Thank you. Our next question will first go to Natalie Paravincini. Um, Natalie, this year voters in Benton County are selecting county commissioners through ranked choice voting, which marks the first time this method of voting has been used in the state of Oregon. Would you support expanding the use of ranked choice voting or another uh, so-called alternative voting method, such as star voting, uh, to be used in a broader uh, array of uh, elections statewide in Oregon? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it, uh, ranked choice voting allows you to rank your candidates and if none wins outright, your second choice gets reverted to that candidate. And Mike Balstein is running for city commissioner on the ranked choice voting. It is a method of voting that allows much wider participation into the process itself with more candidates, more voices, more ideas. Uh, campaigns become less about mud slinging because I want your candidate, your voters to rank me second. So I'm not gonna be mud slinging. And it really frees people to participate without the fear of being punished because their opponents um, as if two voices or two opinions could represent this country, right? So yes, I'm a huge supporter. It also allows for less primaries, less money spent on elections. It is cost effective. There is just, it's a win-win, win. Uh, I'll next direct this question to Kim Thatcher. Thank you. Well, I can't be opposed to it. That's how I was chosen in the, uh, the independent primary of Oregon vote. They had star voting. And though I got some reports back from people that it was a little confusing, they didn't know what to do with the stars. So I think there needs to be some, you know, a robust education. Uh, so whatever system we end up uh, using uh, is well known as to how it works. Um, it's pretty straightforward what we have right now, but I would like to see how uh, it works out in Benton County and how, you know, the reports back from voters on how they liked it. 
um, if it's something that we should explore expanding. I'm, I'm definitely open to it. If that's what the legislature wants to do and what the people want to do, that's, you know, let's, let's make it work. Thank you, Kim. Um, and we'll direct the question now to Shamia Fagan. I think ranked choice voting is a very exciting electoral reform. Just to clarify for your listeners, Benton County is not using star voting uh, this fall. They're using ranked choice voting, which is different than star voting. Star voting, as Senator Thatcher alluded to, is a little bit more confusing. Ranked choice voting is more straightforward. If folks can rank their number one, number two, or number three choice. And then as, as Ms. Paravicini mentioned, if, you know, if your number one choice doesn't get over 50% of the vote, then your number two choice kicks in. But Maine has been doing this statewide for all of their elections for many years and it has shown to increase voter participation because voters don't have to try to be pundits and try to predict and they don't have to worry about people saying, oh, you're going to spoil your vote if you, you know, if you like these two candidates closely, but this one looks like they're more likely to win. You don't want to throw it to the candidate you like the least. And so you end up with these strategic voting choices. Let's just let folks participate in democracy and vote for the person they like the best and the person they like the second best and maybe the person they like the third best. So I, I share Senator Thatcher's concerns about making sure that there is an educational component there. My big concern with it would just be that we don't leave lower information, lower propensity voters further behind. But what Maine has seen is that some of those lower propensity voters turn out in higher numbers because of ranked choice voting, uh, because they have more options on the ballot. I'm really excited to see how Benton County does with it. Thank you. Um, and once again, we're listening to a conversation, um, a forum with the Secretary of State candidates in Oregon. Uh, Natalie Paravincini, Shimia Fagan, and Kim Thatcher are with us today, uh, sponsored by the City Club of Eugene. Our next question will first go to Kim Thatcher. Uh, and I'd like to ask about audits in the Secretary of State's uh, role. Are audits purely educational or informational for taxpayers and lawmakers to act on if they wish? Should the Secretary of State have more of a, an enforcement mechanism to go with the audits? Well, okay. so. Voters every year send legislators and a governor, well, not every year, but they send their legislators and governor to office to accomplish some things. And a lot of promises are made. And the promises that are made are, can be audited. We can see if these promises are being kept. And they can just be educational, but I think more importantly, we need to have uh, this robust conversation, audit for truth, and then look at ways of making things better and then advocate for those changes. Thankfully, as being the longest serving member of the Legislative Audits Committee, I've seen it change in a good way, where the audits that the Secretary of State's office does are now being connected to the, the audits, or excuse me, the agency being audited so that they're having to uh, be accountable for the recommendations made or whether they don't agree and why and how, when they're going to start adhering to the, the recommendations that are being made. Now, some of the recommendations might require some legislative changes or maybe some funding, and those definitely can help inform those conversations that need to be had. Now, if they're still not going to be you know, the legislature is not seriously going to be looking at some of these reforms that are very important, then we go to the, we go to the people and we let the people make their wishes known and their, uh, their desire to see some more accountability or some positive changes within these agencies, uh, along with what the recommendations were from the auditors. Now, as far as having a, a hammer, you know, that's, that's something that the Secretary of State doesn't have. You're right. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I'll next, uh, or pose the same question now to Shamia Fagan. Audits are the most important tool the Secretary of State has to make sure that our policies reflect Oregon values. And, you know, given my background, I, I know the impact on a family when public services fail, uh, like our broken healthcare system that left my mom battling addiction for most of my life, our housing crisis and housing policies that left my family pushed in and out of homelessness. But I also know what's possible when public services work, like the public schools in Wasco County that literally changed the course of my life. And so when I look at audits, I think about them as a way to make sure that public services in Oregon are making a real difference in the lives of people who need them. And that's why I've committed to auditing the Oregon Employment Department, and not just to find out what went wrong in 2020, but exactly to your point, Chris, 
to find out what went wrong previously because previous audits had been done on the Oregon Employment Department that could have prevented the crisis that we have seen ourselves in in 2020. Why weren't those audits followed through? And so I think that my audits of the Oregon Employment Department will also include an audit of follow-up on those recommendations that come out. Why weren't they followed? And what can I do as Secretary of State to make sure that those solid recommendations are followed through in the future? Thank you. And the question about audits now for uh, Natalie Paravincini. Yes, I think audits are really important in that uh, they, they inform decision making and allow to track results. Um, I would, the way that I would look also um, at audits is, uh, um, the, um, are we really getting the value of these policies, of the policies that are adopted? not just to see how the uh, or agency is spending the money. What I have seen in recent years is, for example, the health authority had a catastrophic uh, contract with computers. The employment agency just was a disaster sending um, the checks and the Department of Environmental Quality also with the, all of the supervision have been really lacking. Uh, so I think that there must be a systemic thing going on or complacency in the agencies. Uh, for all of this to happen in so, so few years. Um, I would like to see whether there's a commonality in a systemic problem. Thank you very much. Um, our next question will uh, first go to Shamia Fagan. Um, Oregon Secretary of State is uh, one step away, some people say one heartbeat away, or uh, one resignation away from being governor. What qualifies you to be governor should that situation arise? Well, I am certainly excited to run as Secretary of State, but I understand that one of the duties of Secretary of State is to serve as Oregon's de facto Lieutenant Governor. And we saw that obviously in 2015 when Secretary of State Kate Brown became governor through that function. And so I take that very seriously, which is why I've been open with Oregonians in this campaign about my views on anything they've asked about, even if it doesn't directly relate to my duties as Secretary of State, because everything relates to our duties as Lieutenant Governor. And as a kid who grew up poor in a, the east of the Cascades, um, I've dedicated my legislative career to making changes that benefit all Oregon families. When folks tried to make it where we only had paid sick leave in the metro counties, I fought against that and said, no, we need to have that statewide. When folks tried to fight against having housing stability statewide and only focused in the metro areas, I fought against that and said, no, we need housing stability. You need to know that you have a place to live, whether you're in Harney County or in Wallowa County or in Multnomah County or down in Curry County. And so I think it's, it's important to recognize that that we actually have policies that benefit our whole state, even if Republican legislators vote against them, it doesn't mean that Oregon Republican people, everyday people sitting around their kitchen tables oppose those policies. And I would be a governor for all of Oregon. Thank you. I'll pose this question now to Natalie Paravicini. Yes, I think that what's really important in a position of uh, uh, the governor is being able to lead, to provide leadership, because that's that what the position calls for, um, to be able to make quick decisions with a broad impact and be able to bring people along, have been having a lot of good communication, delegation skills, and uh, community building skills to make those urgent decisions and carry them through. And uh, that's been... Um, something that has characterized my work from the past to now is being able to provide that leadership vision and being able to work with a broad swath of people. Thank you. And I'll pose a question now to Kim Thatcher. I could only find three instances in Oregon state history where a secretary of state succeeded to the office of governor. Um, our current governor being the last example of that. So um, yeah, I guess it could happen. It would be a, an unusual combination of events for, for me. I think it'd be much more likely that my um, Democratic opponent would become governor if uh, she were to win the office of Secretary of State simply because I, I believe that, um, our current governor would find a position with a Biden administration and uh, would be very comfortable taking that position if my opponent, my Democratic opponent, were to be elected. Now, um, now having said that, I think it's very important that we have uh, a governor who has some executive capabilities. I've been a business owner for 28 years. I've managed large budgets, lo lots of moving parts, people, and projects, and I think it's important that we have somebody who can be a manager 
um, and then rec recognizes the importance of our economy and small businesses in our economy and the importance of education and making sure those dollars are helping our, our students succeed and making sure that our services are working as they should. Um, they're, you know, all along I've been saying we've, need to, we've needed to make sure that we can respond well to emergencies because COVID was not going to be the last of these emergencies and then lo and behold the fire, wildfires came along. So I think there's a lot that can be done that's positive. I think, first of all, we need continuity of government and that would be my primary focus if something like that were to happen and I were to succeed to the position of governor. Thank you. Uh, our next question will first go to Natalie Paravicini. Um, on the ballot this year in Oregon is Measure 107. It would allow the creation of laws to uh, limit campaign contributions. Do you support this measure? And if so, what do you see as a potentially reasonable limit on contributions to a political candidate? I absolutely support the measure. I love it for it. Um, I, one of the main reasons why I'm running for Secretary of State is exactly because we need electoral reform and campaign finance reform. Money is not speech. Money is property. The concept that a corporation has rights to speak is really a complete perversion of our laws. And that needs to be completely challenged. It cannot be that a company who is eternal, basically, is going to be, have the same rights than me or than you who can get sick or who needs, who has children need to feed. It is uh, an obscenity that money is driving every single decision in our society, starting with uh, the criminal justice system and healthcare. Don't even get me started on healthcare because money talks in healthcare and what suffers is the health of the public. And I'm a doctor and I cannot tell you the hoops I have to go through to get care for my patients. That is why I'm running for office. Thank you. I uh, will pose the question now to Kim Thatcher. Well, yes, I voted for the underlying bill and I submitted a campaign uh, uh, yes vote in the voters pamphlet uh, because 107 includes cracking down on uh, DART money groups, um, those that are appearing neutral but are actually supporting candidates without disclosing where their funding's coming from. I think that Oregon voters are kind of sick and tired of that nonsense. They're going to support 107. So having said that, what does a limit look like? I don't know what the best number is, but I do know that if we're, we're not careful, we can end up uh, disadvantaging, as has been shown in other states, we could possibly end up disadvantaging challengers to incumbents or third party candidates. Um, so I would form a multi-partisan advisory group uh, to assist in uh, helping inform that legislation as it comes forward, as, as, as it relates to statewide. Um, I think that in, in my case, I've got thousands of unique donors. I have some, you know, one large one, but um, most of them have been small and within the state. And I think that speaks to um, a difference between my opponent and I, who's gotten over two, two, over two and a half million dollars from fewer than 15 PACs. And um, most, much of them from big government special interest unions. And, and none of these workers had no idea their union dollars were gonna be going to uh, help uh, elect my opponent who is going to help these union bosses get more and more power and control and you know favors. So I think whatever we do, we need to make sure we're not disadvantaging or advantage one particular group or another. Thank you. Uh, our, our, we'll pose this question about Measure 107 now to Shamia Fagan. I first met Measure 107 when it was called Senate Joint Resolution 18, which I was thrilled to vote to send to the voters this fall, and I encourage everybody to vote for that. And it amends Oregon Constitution, the Oregon Constitution to allow campaign finance limits, contribution limits, and disclosure requirements. And I absolutely support it, and I know the Oregonians do too. I think it's important that we follow a few principles. Uh, number one is that we don't want to have the limit so low that we essentially drive campaign spending out of the control of candidates who can be accountable for it into independent expenditures where it's very hard for candidates to have control. I think that somewhere, I mean, the legislature will ultimately decide on these limits. 
in the next session, but I think it's, I think somewhere in the range of what the federal limits are probably makes sense because it's less confusing for people. And also to recognize that not all contribution sources are the same. One donor giving $100,000 is not the same as 100,000 donors giving $1 and uh, joining that together. I'm proud to be supported by the multi-partisan uh, working people across this state, the firefighters and the teachers and the healthcare providers and the nurses and the postal workers who are out on the front lines fighting COVID every single day. And I have never apologized, nor will I apologize that they choose, choose to pool their small donations together and support me as the candidate of working people. Thank you. Uh, as a reminder, we're listening to a conversation between three of the candidates for Oregon Secretary of State, Natalie Paravincini with the Pacific Green and Progressive Parties, a Democrat Shamia Fagan and Republican Kim Thatcher. We have time for perhaps a couple more questions and then I'll remind our candidates that there will also be one minute for a closing statement at the very end. So we will want to leave time for that. Our next question first goes to Kim Thatcher. Uh, these have been challenging economic times for a lot of individuals and companies, uh, businesses in Oregon this year. What, if anything, can the Secretary of State do to encourage economic vitality in the state? Having been a business owner for 28 years, I, you know, I know what it's like to be a small business in this state, and this has been an unprecedented year of difficulties for small businesses. So what the Secretary of State's office can do is through the corporation division is the Office of Small Business Advocacy. And within that, and that's something I helped set up back in 2011, that is something that is so key to the, our small businesses helping them work through uh, not only agency nonsense that could be happening, but helping uh, helping them find resources and like they spent a lot of their time during this these last several months helping uh, get get businesses hooked up with some of the CARES Act funding so that they would be able to bridge some of those uh, difficulties happening due to COVID shutdowns. It's it's so important that we have a, a corporation division that's serving as a welcome mat and and not as a you know a, 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 you know, a no solicitor sign to help encourage businesses that are here to stay here and, and grow and encourage other businesses to come here and advocate for their um, economic survival. I just think it's important that um, the audits division can also be used to help account for all the money that we're using um, making sure that we're being the most efficient with our services that will attract businesses as well and help keep our taxes lower without, you know, looking to businesses to, to um, help, you know, make up whatever dis difference. So there's, there's a number of things I think Secretary of State's office can do and play a role in helping our economy. Thank you. I uh, will pose a question now to Shamia Fagan. The first bill that I ever chief co-sponsored uh, as a legislator, freshman legislator, was to create the Office of Small Business Assistance in the Secretary of State's office and making sure that there is a one-stop shop. And number one is Secretary of State. I will make sure that office is fully staffed. There will be no cuts in that office. We will make sure that Oregon small businesses have that advocate in the office that they can call with any question, any letter they get, any need for services, um, to make sure that they have that one-stop shop. I was committed to that in my first term and I'm committed to that today. Also to the audits function, we can make sure that the, the revenue that Oregon is spending to invest in businesses is being used efficiently to make sure that we don't have uh, quasi-governmental organizations like the Oregon Forest Resources Institute that's out there wasting taxpayer dollars as was exposed by an OPB and Oregon Live report. Um, essentially, uh, taxpayers funding the timber industry to lie to Oregonians about the impacts of climate change. I think it's important uh, that we make sure that our that folks' tax dollars, whether it's businesses or Oregonians, are used efficiently and for their best use. Thank you. And uh, we'll post this question now to Natalie Paravicini. Yes, um, I want to pick up on uh, what uh, Ms. Fagan was saying. Um, I think that one of the um, aspects of the audits is to bring to light um, 
all of the uh, misuse of funding uh, in the timber industry. But I think that the issue of uh, vital economic vitality supersedes the Secretary of State office. When we have a state that gives so many tax credits to a major industry like timber and it zaps resources from the local communities, that is going to be the primary driver of uh, displacement and difficulty at the, at the local level. And that needs to be addressed. And uh, the Oregonian did uh, an amazing report on that called polluted by money. And I highly, highly, highly recommend that you look it up. It's easily available online. And the other thing that's really very important is again, uh, I, as a small business, uh, I think that what, what I, I think may be helping a lot is lack of cooperation between the agencies, especially when small businesses start. And I think that increasing cooperation and communication between agencies, not only within just the department between, but across agencies, might actually bring a lot of efficiencies and uh, facilitate a lot of processes, which is really, I mean, the biggest, I mean, the, the biggest hurdle for a small business is administrative. Uh, so that would be really uh, something to look at. And it may be what's happening in other agencies. Our next question will go to Shamia Fagan. One of the major responsibilities of the Secretary of State is to structure a redistricting plan in cases when the legislature is unable to agree on a plan. Uh, sometimes the legislature agrees, but many times they have not over the years. What kind of process would you use for redistricting if it falls to you and your office? Well, I have been uh, committed to using a people's commission, which is a nonpartisan group that is independent from the Secretary of State, but is also rooted in racial equity. I think it's important that when we talk about redistricting, we're talking about the census. And when we talk about the census, we can't ignore the fact that when our first census was taken, not everybody that was a person in our country was counted as a full human being because of the three-fifths clause. And so I think it's important that when we do redistricting, we make sure that we actually center that on historically underrepresented communities. Uh, but there needs to be robust hearings, at least 10 hearings before any maps are drawn, at least five hearings after the maps are drawn, a hearing at least one in each congressional district, at least one in the district that's seen the biggest shift in population. I mean, making sure that we have technology, even if our COVID crisis were to be uh, tapering off by then to make sure that folks can participate remotely, that we reach out to communities of interest and, um, and make sure that you have live language translation on site, that we provide childcare for the hearings and meals and have those at various points in the day. So we really encourage participation. Um, you know, I wasn't in the legislature in 2011, Senator Thatcher was, and she did vote on her own uh, lines. And I think the Oregonians don't want politicians drawing their own lines. They can draw themselves nice, comfortable, safe districts where they don't really face any real opposition. I think that it's time that we take that uh, to a people's commission. Uh, we'll pose this question now to Natalie Paravicini. I also agree, and I think there is general agreement that we need to use a commission. I also think it is very important that the commission be representative and that we have access to the hearings before and afterwards. Um, of course, being a Green Party member, I have an outsider's perspective and bring um, lack of partisanship. I don't bring partisanship into the process. Um, and we all, I think, agree on the commission. And we'll pose the question now to Kim Thatcher. Thank you. Uh, you know, from the beginning during my primary and every time since then, I have been highly supportive of what was laid out in Initiative Petition 57. Initiative Petition 57 includes much of what Secretary of State Rich Dennis Richardson was working on. Um, he was working with uh, good government groups. I think possibly even the League of Women Voters was included in that and others to come up with a proposal that would um, assist him, you know, if he was going to be faced with redistricting. Unfortunately, he, he passed away, but I support what was in, in, in uh, Initiative Petition 57. And it's unfortunate it couldn't come forth, but it does have includes strong language for uh, including communities of color and representation and making sure that there is that uh, resolve to make sure that underrepresented communities are not given a diluted voice and um, giving, giving them a stronger voice. So it's funny that my, my main opponent, uh, Shamia Fagan, says that she is in favor of a people's commission and wanting to sound independent and all that when she said during her primary that the current system, you know, when it's not broke, don't fix it. 
and that she uh, you know, accepted $100,000 from a Democratic redistricting group, a national re Democratic redistricting group, which is bent on uh, you know, helping uh, give an edge to Democratic uh, candidates. So that doesn't sound very independent to me, but I think it's important to point out that the system we have right now hasn't changed. We still have the legislature um, giving uh, given first shot at drawing the lines and what happened in 2011 gives me great motivation to want to change that system from having legislators choose their boundary lines which it didn't change greatly it's pretty much based on uh, the redistricting that had been done 10 years before that it just kind of nibbled around the edges but I think it's very important that we have an independent commission and people that are that we can get multi-partisan buy-in on it and not have it be a gerrymandered sort of situation, which I think we've seen over the past 20 years or so. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we'll next move on to our closing statements as uh, time is running uh, to an end here. And uh, I misspoke earlier, we'll have uh, two minutes uh, per candidate for closing statements, and we will start with Shamia Fagan. Well, thank you so much to the Eugene City Club and Chris, to you for this great forum, to my colleagues here, Dr. Parvacini and Senator Thatcher. Elections are about choices, and I believe that Oregonians have a clear choice this election, uh, particularly between Senator Thatcher and myself. Uh, a clear choice between a candidate who has voted lockstep with her party to restrict access to the ballot and one who has led the fight to expand access to the ballot. One candidate who has stayed quiet when the president and his allies have spread misinformation and conspiracy theories that undermine public health and our democracy, and one who has boldly spoken against those untruths. A candidate who is uh, propped up by primarily right-wing organizations like the Oregon Firearms Federation, the anti-vaccine movement, and uh, the largest anti-abortion lobby in Oregon, and a candidate who is supported uh, across a multiple partisan, multi-ideologies ideologies, uh, by the folks you've trusted for decades. I'm proud to be endorsed by newspapers across this state who had previously endorsed Dennis Richardson from the Oregonian, the Willamette Week, the Eugene Weekly, uh, all the way over to the East Oregonian and the Ben Bulletin. The Ben Bulletin told Oregonians that, that I have a track record of being willing to buck my party's establishment. And that's the kind of independence that you deserve and that you will see from me as Secretary of State. I'm proud to be endorsed by the Oregon League of Conservation Voters and uh, Planned Parenthood PAC. I'm proud to be endorsed by the American Postal Workers Union, the firefighters fighting across our state, the teachers and the nurses working on the front lines as heroes every day. But I'm not done until I can add you to that list. So my name is Shamia Fagan, and I'm asking for your vote this November or this October, whenever you sit down to vote safely by mail here in Oregon. Thank you. For our closing statement now, we'll go to Natalie Paravicini. Um. I am running for Secretary of State because across the board, we need more choice. We need a bigger voice. We need a voice that's not uh, tied to lobbying, to big money, to big, pol you know, to, to big par parties. You cannot have just a good cop, a bad cop, and then you know, it's uh, always a losing, a losing proposition. We need increased voices. That's why we need the ranked choice voting across the state. That was one of the main purposes for me running is to uh, push the envelope for electoral reform, expansion of uh, registration, um, ranked choice voting, uh, campaign finance reform, and also the Secretary of State, we didn't talk about it, but sits on the land board. And we have uh, the opportunity to save some of the last remaining old growth, which have been shown to burn at much lower temperatures and to weather fires much better. And in light of the climate change, the role that the Secretary of State has uh, to preserve forests like this, uh, Elliot Forest, um, is critical. Same thing with the Jordan Cove. Uh, we cannot put more carbon into the air. What we're seeing in terms of the fires and climate change, it's just the beginning. This is an exponential curve. It's going to get mar markedly worse. And we need a radical voice who's willing to speak, not from the left or not from the right, but from up front. 
We need to be upfront and we need choice in our elections. And so if you want an independent voice that's going to really push the envelope where it needs to be, to be a vote Green Party, Natalie Paravicini for Secretary of State. Thank you very much. I have enjoyed meeting my two candidates very much. And thank you very much for running as well. And thank you for the League of Women Voters. What could we do without them? Thank you, Natalie. Uh, for a closing statement now, Kim Thatcher. Indeed, thank you, League of Women Voters, and thank you for hosting this today. I've, I've enjoyed working with both of you most of the time. <laughs> Four years ago, Oregonians chose Dennis Richardson, a conservative Republican, to be their Secretary of State, supported by many of the things are in places that my opponent listed off for me. Why did they choose him? Because after years of fiascos like Cover Oregon, a Columbia River Bridge to Nowhere, and then a billion dollar scam from the business energy tax credit, they knew they needed a watchdog in government and not just a lapdog to union bosses and big money special interests. My commitment is to be the help for Oregon families, get them back on track. And we do that by ensuring fair and transparent elections and fair and transparent redistricting that benefits people and not politicians. We do that by taking on the biggest challenges Oregon is facing right now. Like we have kids home from school and endless emergency orders are hurting our small businesses. We have months of civil unrest and then fires that have displaced thousands of our neighbors. We take these problems, we audit for truth, we use these audits to hold government accountable and then make the needed reforms. Is our $9 billion education budget helping students succeed? Heck, we've got kids not being able to uh, log into the internet right now. They don't even have the ability to log into the internet right now. Are these kids getting the education that they need? So. We've got, my commitment is to look into this and help make sure that our, uh, our $9 billion is going towards education and helping our students succeed. We've got to make sure that we fix the unemployment system and never have that happen again. I'm proud to say that 99% of my donations have come from Oregon and Oregon people. I am the only candidate in this race that has a coalition of people from left, right, and middle to, uh, you know, they're ready for a change. Um, if you want to get us back on the path that Dennis Richardson was taking us on, I ask for your vote and check out my website at kimthatcher.com. Thank you. Kim Thatcher, Shamia Fagan, and Natalie Curvincini, thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. This has been our October 30th, 2020 program, the Oregon Secretary of State Candidate Forum. Before we proceed, I'd like to recognize some gold sponsors. Gatos, Churnside, and Balthrop, Attorneys at Law, Evans, Elder, Brown, and Subert, Commercial Real Estate, and the Hearing Associates, Dr. Sandy Ibarra. It is our expectation to have these taped conversations available by Fridays at noon. We want to thank you all for supporting us during this difficult time. Before we thank our speakers today, there are a few quick announcements. Thank you to our in-kind sponsors, KRVM 91.9 Radio, PAC Info and Simplified Computing, LLC, Dot Dotson's Photography, and Network Charter School. And a special thank you to public radio station KLCC 89.7 for airing City Club programs on Mondays at 7 p.m. And thank you to Community Television of Lane County Cable Channel 29 for televising recent City Club programs. Our programs are always available on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. Next week, we focus on monuments and memorials. In recent years, we have watched or read about the destruction of monuments whose message has been rejected. We will welcome John Weber, Michael Geffel, and David Harrelson to discuss clarify, and challenge mainstream notions about monuments and memorials. You may send questions for upcoming programs to the City Club's Executive Director, 
The program's moderator will select those questions to be asked for each program. Please send your questions to administrator at cityclubofeugene.org. Please join us again on next Friday. More details and information about future programs can be found online at the City Club's website, cityclubofeugene.org. Now I would like to thank today's speaker for a great program, Shamia Fagan, Natalie Paravanici, and Kim Thatcher. This includes today's program. Be well and stay safe.